Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 58. As always, my name is Mark, and here with me today, one of the most interesting and, uh, I guess, enigmatic, is that the right word? I don't know, designers on the market making some very, I guess, bizarre games is one way to put it. Uh, Games that are unlike anything you see. I'm watching Tom laugh here because uh, I had to restart the podcast and my description just got about 10 times more enthusiastic of him. And uh, I don't know. I When you when you, when you you do it again, you want to say something different. Anyways, here with me today, Tom Russell. I'm very happy you're on. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It was really clean the first time through, and now I've made a mess of it. But that is no, tradition fine. here on the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. Uh, the intro or the conclusion have to be butchered somehow. Yeah, I've been. I'm, I'm happy to have you on. I I think I first heard about your games about a year ago when I heard about 4x, the currency exchange or foreign exchange currency game, and the the all I heard was that it's a very odd, super deterministic economic game and i was like well that sounds right down my alley and uh it's certainly an interesting design and then i've been keeping tabs on you since and i think uh like i said one of the more interesting designers in our hobby as with all of my guests so far my traditional first question goes into what got you into the board game hobby so what was that introduction point for you what how'd you get started in designing or or, or at least into the community of playing modern board games. So actually it was uh, a few different things that kind of all happened around the same time in the space of a, f- a few days uh, that all kind of pointed me at the existence of modern board games. And it, it happened at a time when I was actually very receptive to that. So a little bit of background I've always been kind of a creative person, uh, but I didn't quite know where to put all that energy. Like, I tried different things. I tried uh, filmmaking, and I tried writing fiction and all sorts of different forms of of expression, and I never got anywhere with any of it. And I was very frustrated, and I was pushing myself a lot, spending all my time trying to find the thing where where I, I would make it. You know, and uh, it made me very unpleasant to be around because I wasn't really, I wasn't really paying attention to the people around me, the world around me. Everything was focused very narrowly on, you know, being creative and trying to find, you know, who who I was, what I was going to do creatively. And it got to the point where I, I kind of stressed myself out to the point where I got sick and actually had to have. Uh, surgery. And in in the wake of that, I kind of relaxed and started paying more attention to people, being a better friend to people and paying more attention to the world around me and not focusing all my time and attention on, you know, trying to make something. And so I ended up spending a day in Ann Arbor, my wife, Mary and I, with one of our friends. Ann Arbor is a college town in Michigan. And I wouldn't have done that before. Because, you know, the weekend I have some time, I'm going to spend it writing this screenplay or working on this video game I'm programming or whatever I'm doing. Uh, But now at at that point, I just was enjoying being around people and enjoying, you know, going around Ann Arbor looking at stuff. And we go to a comic book shop. And in the basement of the comic book shop, they have these board games that I've never heard of. They have the name of the designer on the box, which I'd never seen before. They have this big $300 version of some game called Sellers of Catan that I've, I've never heard of with these big deluxe components. And I'm like, what, what is this? You know? And like the next day, I was on uh, Wikipedia hitting the, the random article button, and an article comes up for something called 18xx. And there's a link at the bottom to a video by some guy named Scott Nicholson, and he has other videos on on board games. And at the same time, I'm working on on a new video game, but I don't know if it's going to be fun or not. It's going to take me a long time to program it. 
And I think, well, maybe instead of doing all this programming work for weeks or months and then turns out it's not fun, can I try to prototype it physically as a board game, basically? And so I'm doing that. And then an f- old friend of mine out of the blue gets in touch with me and wants to know if I want to join something called a Blood Bowl League with him and his and his buddies. So all these things happen like in a three or four day span, all kind of pointing me at the existence of, of board games. And I I listened, you know, I gave I gave it a try and uh, found that I enjoyed playing them and found that the things I think that were holding me back trying to succeed in other art forms, the, the tendencies I had, the way I looked at things, things that were a problem for those forms fit better with board games. And so uh, almost immediately I started trying to design board games. What tendencies do you mean? What what was what fit uh, into board games that didn't in, in movies or writing? Well, a, a lot of it is that uh, kind of on, on a structural level, I basically was looking for something that was very streamlined and, and elegant in a way. And it doesn't necessarily work for a, a lot of film because it's not mechanical, you know, uh, and film and, and fiction and all that. I mean, it's, it's, it's about a lot of times so it's about a human experience and and humans are messy and they're not deterministic and they, they don't fit into a system. So the things I were doing were, were more systemic, right? More about looking at systems, expressing systems, things fitting together as a system. And all that works a lot better for board games than it does for those other forms. So that, that, was, that was a big thing there, I think. Huh. And I know you have made a, a, a couple of movies, at least I, I know mm-hmm. you, I, I looked you up on IMDb and saw you did have mm-hmm. some credits there. Is looking back on those movies, do you, is that something you notice that you kind of look that I, I, you know, I don't know much anything about those movies, but is that something that you notice looking back that it was, as you say, kind of more systemic in terms of um, your thinking with those? It, I mean, it, it was and it wasn't. I was so the movies that are on IMDb, those are movies that me and and my wife Mary made and directed together, and she looks at it very differently than I do. Mm-hmm. And so, the, so the end result was kind of a, a synthesis of how the both of us were looking at things. So, I mean, I can't look at the films and say that they're cold and systemic the way um the way for example certain uh films by Rainer Werner Fassbinder could be determined as it being cold and systemic. But a lot of that is that Mary brings a lot of warmth to it. Sure. Yeah. And and also we were making comedies. So uh you know I, I think if I make if I'm making like serious drama, the tendency would be more apparent. Okay. I mean, but I mean but the films we didn't really get anywhere with them. And you know, uh Part of that is just, you know, we have our own sense of humor in the comedies, and it doesn't necessarily resonate with everybody. The example I, I tend to default to is that the the last one we did, the first scene before the opening credits is 25 minutes long, and it is a phone conversation about a utility bill that has no bearing on the rest of the film. And for us, it was very funny, but uh, it wasn't for anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, – yeah, 22 minutes is quite a while. It was, the idea was just kind of setting the tone like uh, – I mean, it, it, to a degree, it was yeah. like a, 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 you know, thematically, it was somewhat relevant the same way. So there's a film, Andrei Rublev, that was uh, directed by uh, Tarkovsky. Uh, and that's two and a half, three hours long. But the – First 10 minutes or so has nothing to do with the rest of the film to the point where when I saw the film with some friends at the uh, Detroit Institute of Arts, this is 15 odd years ago, we weren't sure if the opening scene had actually been part of the movie or if it was like a mass hallucination we had had. And but thematically, it was relevant. Mm -hmm. And so the scene in ours, you know, thematically, it was relevant, but also it was kind of this shaggy dog kind of of joke where the longer it goes on the funnier it was oh sure yeah yeah for us and it's like how how much longer can this scene go 
And that was amusing to us, but not uh, certainly not to the, the festival programmers who did not get through that first scene. <laughs> and, oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Tarantino did you know, Tarantino had the uh the diner scene in Reservoir Dogs. I guess that was more of an introduction to the characters. Yeah. Uh, the Coens did an opening thing with the serious man that was completely unrelated. I, I love that. That was great. I, um, I absolutely adore that movie. It's such a great movie. And yeah, that opening scene is just perfect in ways that you can't describe easily. It's just mm-hmm. in, entirely a tonal, thematic thing. And then they go into the movie proper. Oh, man, I could go on for, about movies for a very long time. You've also reminded me that I have a plan with a friend to to go through Tarkovsky. Because I actually haven't seen any Tarkovsky films. And it's I've been wanting to watch his movies for a very long time. But i got to contact him. We're going to watch all of them. Anyways, back to board games. Uh, <laughs> So you, you, you kind of, you said you kind of dive into design right away. Was it something where you just immediately immersed and then like, I want to do this full time or was, was it more gradual? I mean, there always was the kind of the urge that uh, I would like this to be something that I could do as a living at some mm-hmm. point. When I got started, when I got started, I was playing Euro games. So I was designing Euro games generally. And n- none of them sold. <laughs> no, no one wanted them. And, you know, I did one war game as a lark. And I, I can't stress this enough. It, it was like for giggles. I'm going to do a war game. That one sold. And uh, then I did another one and that sold. And eventually I'm a war game designer, you know, almost by accident. That said, when I was looking at it early on, it was like, okay, I'm going to do these, these Euro games. Uh, I'm going to sell some, you know, as a freelance designer. If I build up enough of a reputation, uh, then uh, Mary and I might be able to get into publishing, you know, trading on that reputation. Because that's that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. As far as if you're trying to make a living at it, I mean, there are some designers who make a living at it because they they design, you know, big smash hit games. But if you don't sign big smash hit games, there's very little money for the designer. And you're going to get a lot more money as a publisher. Uh, so that was kind of like the the goal. We didn't it didn't quite work the way I you know we thought it would. And a lot of that is uh, you know as I got in more into war games, uh, you know other opportunities opened up, and uh, Mary and I both ended up working. I ended up working for a magazine uh, publisher for war games for a brief time, and Mary ended up working for a, a folio game publisher. Uh, both which kind of function on what is essentially a print-on-demand model. And once we learned that model and learned the uh, technical craft of preparing games for publication, uh, we realized, hey, we we can do this. And, and that's eventually what got us to forming our own company and eventually to doing it full-time. So it wasn't you – know, I was expecting, like, I would have to build up some kind of reputation – so people would know who I was, and but that didn't really happen. Like people didn't really become aware of my designs uh, until after Hollenspiel had started, uh, with the exception of, of some people who were into the uh, the winsome designs I did. You know, it's, it's certainly that had some eyes on it. But uh, you know, I did twenty odd published games before anyone really started paying attention to what I was doing. Yeah. So and and I find it interesting that. You started with Euro games before transitioning and finding more of a home in war gaming. When I when I hear about that, I think it it seems like that works because of the way war game the war gaming community generally looks at games. And this is something I've been thinking about for a while. Is that you know in terms of like you said in being a, a very systemic thinker and thinking about games as systems for modeling something that could in theory fit with any kind of genre right any kind of setting but i feel like and again this is coming more of from someone who's kind of dipped his toes a little bit in a bunch of different areas of the board gaming world that that war gamers want that more they want something that simulates that looks at something as a system that can be tinkered with rather than kind of the traditional euro game where it's more about i don't know how i would describe that about having the process of playing the game be interesting regardless of the thematic qualities. 
you think that's yeah. accurate as a, I, I think, as a hypothesis? I, I, yeah, I think that's essentially accurate. I mean, all all games are systems. Sure. Uh, all, all, all games uh, are are machines in a way, and and they're, they're, mo- they're modeling something. I think the essential difference between Euro games and war games is that because uh, both have to be you know uh, enjoyable and both have to be well designed systems with uh, well integrated mechanisms. But with war games, what the system's representing is also important and sometimes more important. Uh, whereas hero games, it's kind of it could be anything a lot of the time. Uh, I, I think th- the idea of the themeless euro is thrown around more often than is warranted because some euros are very thematic and the integration oh, yeah. is very good. But um, generally, the theme, uh, the history, the 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 thing that it's about is going to be more significant in a war game than than in a euro game, and to the point where. There are people who are very staunchly, you know, Euro gamers. I mean, mostly I can encounter kind of Omni gamers who do a little bit of, of everything. But mm-hmm. um, I think there's more and more of those uh, as, as the hobby continues to evolve. But um, there are a lot of kind of staunch Euro gamers who cannot understand the war gamers focus on 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 the theme or history of what's being modeled. Uh, when we announced. Uh, one of our games, which was uh, This Guilty Land, which came out um, last year. But when we announced it the year previous, I got into this Twitter argument with this guy who's like, why why don't you just retheme this? And and there was nothing I could say to explain to him why it was about this theme. Because he looked at it as, you know, the game are, it is this collection of mechanisms, and then you kind of slather a theme on top of it. Mm-hmm. And that that's frustrating sometimes encountering that because it's like speaking two different languages, you know. Yeah. But uh, there are some Euro games though that that I I think the thematic integration is very good and it is a very good representation, a very good model. It's just that I guess disguises it more, or because it's less confrontational, or the theme is less uh, troubling for people that they don't necessarily see it that way. I don't know. Right. And, and there's a lot of talk about kind of we're living in this age of like hybrid board games where the traditional American fantasy or sci-fi or, you know, smashing into each other stuff is integrating with Euro design mechanisms. But I think the more interesting integration is the ideas that we got from Euro games in terms of making mechanically interesting puzzles and such combined with really deep thematic integration. I think that's what's exciting me at this point. I think it seems like that's that's kind of where you approach your designs from. Yeah, I, I would say so. And, you know, I think coming to war games from having been in Euro games it significantly influences how my work turns out. Mm-hmm. If I had come to war games without a Euro game uh, background, as it were, I, I don't know if I would be as successful or if my games would be as streamlined. Or as or, or have mechanisms that kind of stand out as much, because there is a, a, a tradition in war games of uh, very much building on what has come before, where there are a number of games that, on a mechanical level, the foundations are fairly similar. You know, a lot of hex encounter games, you have the attack factor on the left and the moving factor on the right, and you have moving across the hex grid, and you have a move phase and a combat phase and a combat results table. And I'm not disparaging those games at all, and I've done games like that. It's just that they're less likely to be mechanically innovative Mm -hmm. uh, because it's not as much of a focus in that particular tradition. As you get more people coming from Euro games and and more war game designers looking at the Euro games and looking at how that increases the crossover appeal, I think you're getting more people designing more interesting games that uh, even might be better models than the the, the traditional uh, paradigm. Yeah, and I think there's just now, in terms of the people who play war games, and again, I, I've, I feel like I've only dipped my toes in it, even though I, I really like the games I've, the number of games I've played. I mean, if someone enters the hobby now and gets into war games, it's probably not going to come, It's pro- their entry point's probably not going to be the kind of old school hex encounter games anyways. I mean, for me, and I think for a lot of people, it was Twilight Struggle and the coin games. 
uh, mm-hmm. which are unlike that that style completely. But then by that point, it's like, oh, there are all, all these other games called war games that are at least have some shared history. And, and if that's the entry point that you, you're coming from a much different place than, you know, if you got into war games back in the 70s. Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree. And, you know, they're all some form of war game. Because mm-hmm. a war game essentially is a game that's going to engage in some significant, serious way with history. And you can do it all sorts of different ways. And there are a number of war gamers that I talked to who have never played a Hex Encounter game. And that's okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Pulling back to talk about uh, your role as a publisher with Hollenspiel, one of the more unique parts of it is is that you do the print-on-demand system. You talked about how that was kind of, once you learned that, that's when you realized that uh, you could make this work. And thinking about it, I mean, the reason behind that is that you don't need to pay a lot up front. Right? You don't need to take as many risks in uh, investing in a large print run. Uh, every game that is purchased will have some point will will be profitable to you. Um, do you think that's underutilized in the market? Are you are you surprised that there aren't more publishers doing print on demand? Um, I'm surprised to a degree because yeah, it, it, exactly is it, that print on demand it, it eliminates financial risk to a to a very large degree where you don't need to really have capital to start with. So someone who doesn't have money can get into publishing mm-hmm. uh, if that's what they want to do. Now, you know, Kickstarter to a degree does the same thing, but it does it in a in a different a different model because you're basically funding the game through through the, the pledges mm-hmm. to do a traditional print run. But you need to have a game that's going to appeal to a lot of people in order to be successful in, in that funding. You have to have special skills to get that. Print on demand, you don't need those skills. So if you're you're introverted and you have some unusual game or a niche game, print on demand is very appealing in that way. Um, I think the reason why well, I think I think I think two reasons why it is not as prevalent is is one, because you're printing it on demand, you are producing the games in, in the most expensive and least efficient way possible. So you don't have any economies of scale. And because of that, the profit margin is going to be very small. Uh, is small enough in, in our case where we are not part of any kind of retail distribution. We can't be because if we were to sell the game to a retailer at the price that they're used to, we'd be selling the game at a loss. And so if someone is looking at games as uh, a way to make money, as you know, a way to maximize making money, print on demand is a terrible way to do it. If you're looking at it, however, as, as a more of a creative endeavor, or a way to make a little bit of money, enough to live on perhaps, print-on-demand can work very well, but not everyone has that set of values. A a lot of people that I've talked to who want to start publishing, they want to make buckets full of moolah, and that's fine. I'm not not disparaging that, but print-on-demand is not the way to do that. You know, there's a ceiling on how many sales you're going to get because you're not getting in that retail space. And... There's a ceiling because there are a lot of people who just won't buy direct from a publisher. You know, uh, we have people who have talked to us and they would rather pay more through an online retailer or through their friendly local game store than buy from us directly because that's how they're comfortable buying games. Now, I think that's going to shift Mm -hmm. uh, because you've already seen uh, some Kickstarters, for example, that are Kickstarter exclusive. They don't go retail. And those are some large publishers doing that. So I think uh, over time, the industry as a whole is going to shift with direct sales being the, the primary way games are sold. Now, whether that's five years from now or 10 years from now, I you know I have no idea. But it's, it's a natural evolution. And what, what then is the role of the local game stores? I have no idea. You know, I, I, I don't I'm off my little niche corner here. Uh, Mary and I are. So I think as that shift happens, people might be more willing to buy uh, direct sales directly from you know directly from a publisher, and I think that will increase the profitability, uh, the feasibility of a print-on-demand operation for less niche games. Mm-hmm. But right now, it really works best for 
aiming for a specific niche audience and producing uh, specific niche kind of games. And I don't know how many people are really interested in in doing that, you know. Yeah, yeah. In in honesty, I think what you say about moving at least to more direct sales, even if it's not print on demand, like Stonemaier Stonemaier Games has started doing this thing where they sell where he sells you know X copies direct in the pre order, and then everything else goes to distributors. I mean, frankly, when you think about it, the the whole point. The reason you would have a distribution system is that they're providing some kind of value that you can't achieve otherwise. And in you know, in a in a pre-internet era, right, the distributor gets the games out there and, and provides that kind of communication, the availability, and by getting it out into stores. But in an era where that communication barrier doesn't really exist much, uh, you can just tell people, hey, the game is available and then ship it to them um i'm surprised there's not a more aggressive move away from the distribution model uh, no matter what the alternative is you know print on demand or or just you know if the company's big enough just having their own warehouse staff i'm curious to see how it goes in the future have, have you considered doing anything outside of print on demand for instance doing something where you have an initial printing that on a game that you think is going to do really well initial printing and then print on demand after that or, or anything like that uh not not seriously and and the thing is we're we're fairly risk adverse sure you know and and we're fairly comfortable with the way we're doing things so pursuing something where we're looking at more of, a, of, a, of what's closer to a traditional print run the risk there is big enough and the hassles and the headaches where they're big enough are big enough i just I, it, it's not appealing for us. You know, we, we, we just released our uh, 44th box game today. Our 49th game overall, if, if you know, you count like the non-boxed expansions. And so we, we're pretty comfortable with what we're doing. And we're not really looking to change that necessarily. And also the, the stuff that, somewhat perversely, the stuff that sells well for us is the stuff that doesn't have broad appeal. The, the weirder it gets, the more that we sell. But then if we try to transpose that to something that depends on, on broader appeal, I think it will fall flat. Hmm. Interesting. What would you what would you say are the highlights so far in terms of being a publisher for Holland Spiel? Uh I mean, the the, the major highlight is, is, is that we're doing it full time. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. Uh, which we didn't expect to happen, at least not as early. We thought, well, maybe, maybe someday, you know, this will be side income and then someday – Maybe we'll be able to transition to doing this as a full time endeavor. And then six months after we got started, I, I was putting a notice at, at my day job. And ever since then, I, I spend all day, every day with my best friend. And uh, I get to play board games for a living. And uh, I, I still can't believe that I'm getting away with it, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, I, I feel. D- deeply uh, blessed and, and 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 lucky in that regard, and so that that for me that, that's the highlight is, is that you know we're not working for other people, we own our own time. I mean that's that's such an incredible gift, and I'm, I'm just happy about it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, my wife and I we I, I've been working from home for a while, and she just got a job a couple of months ago where she's now working from home, and you know we're not doing the same thing we're just doing separate jobs but in, both being home all day is is pretty wonderful mm-hmm. just just that it's great uh going back to you as a designer you're actually quite prolific i looked it up in, in your you've averaged i didn't i didn't check to see how many were expansions i think most of them are full games and you're over the last five years you've averaged nearly 10 games a year What's your process like to design so many games? I mean, that's like Knizia levels. <laughs> well, um, well, well, well. The, the first part of that process, the first reason for that, basically, is is that I have more time because uh, when I started, you know, about I don't know, ten years ago, starting to design games, I was designing games in you know three, four, five hours a week when I could steal that time uh, from my work schedule and then on weekends and whatnot. Well, now there, you know, there are 168 hours in a week. I'm awake for about 120 of them. 
I'm not designing all those hours, but a decent chunk of that has been working on games. And so that's many more times hours per week than I had initially and that most people have. Um, so that's a big part of why I'm able to do so many games is that I, I have 120 hours in a week to work on games, uh, which you get a lot more done that way. You know, if, if I, I, I can play test a game two, three times a day, every day, rather than waiting for play test night. The, now the pro, the process will change depending on, on the type of game and what it is and how it originates. I have done a lot of work in series. So when I do a series game, I've kind of solved the big problems the first time around and I have much fewer problems to solve with the games in that series so it's it's quicker to do those and that's that's the appeal of series series games really uh from a design perspective generally uh with any war game i'm doing it's going to start with some research a research period where i'm going to try to get basically a, a general understanding of the topic a grounding and an immersion in the topic uh i can dig deeper into it later but it's just getting kind of the big picture and understanding the thing. So I have a framework and I tend to find that that research period works best. If I'm not also trying to design the game while I'm doing the research, because then I get in my own way. You know, if I'm looking for mechanics when I should just be open to, you know, understanding the topic, it, it causes a problem. And, and so the easiest way to do the research is to not know that I'm doing the research so I just try to read about a bunch of different stuff that I'm interested in and to be interested in a bunch of different stuff. And maybe someday I'll make a game on such and such a thing I'm reading about. Maybe I won't, but it's more organic that way. And so eventually I'll decide, hey, yeah, this thing I read about such and such amount of time ago, I'm going to do a game on it. I do a bit more deeper research. And then I kind of just wait until I get a very clear picture of what I want the game to be, how I want it to look, how I want it to feel, what I want to achieve with it. I I need just a clear picture of of the mechanisms and and just the everything. And I don't do any actual quote unquote work on it until I have that picture. And sometimes it just kind of slowly comes together as it percolates in the background. And sometimes I'm actively thinking and working about uh, on the problems. But eventually I get that clear picture, and then I start working on the game, and I keep working on it until it looks like that picture. That's how I know I'm done. Now, sometimes that picture is going to change and shift during the process, um, and that's fine. But I need to have that that picture, those those parameters, in order to get started on it, because otherwise I'm just going to be fumbling trying to find the design. I, I, I hear designers talk about sometimes, you know, as they're working, trying to find the design, trying to find where the fun is, trying to find what it is that the game really is about. And I, I can't do that. That takes too long. I need to know what the game is about, and then I need to, to realize it. And so that that's the general process. There's the research, there's the, the period of waiting for stuff to come together, and then there's the actual working on it uh, and play testing and so on. I'll give you two examples. Uh, coincidentally, two games are coming out at the end of this year. I have a game coming out which is uh, called Westphalia. It's a six-player only uh, negotiation game, and I started researching the Westphalian Conference in the Thirty Years' War uh, about eight years ago. And about three years ago, I thought, you know what? There's a game in this. I'm going to do a game on, on the Treaty of Westphalia, about the Peace Conference. And about two years ago, I had that picture of what I wanted the game to be as started actually working on it. And this summer I finalized design and it's coming out in November. So that that's a you know basically an eight year process. Most of the work being this last couple of years. On the other hand, I have a game sort of coming out. Every year uh, in our holiday sale we have a promotional game where if you buy two games we give you this free game I designed. And I'm doing a game I did a game on the Toledo War, which was a conflict between Michigan and Ohio. And they had that same process of I did the research, I waited for the the picture to come together, and then I started actually working on it till it looked like that picture. 
And but all of that from from the first stage to the last stage was about three days. So uh, sometimes it takes eight years, sometimes it takes three days. It, it depends on the game. Now, there's been a year of playtesting after that for Toledo War, and there's been some slight uh, tweaks made to it, but essentially it is the game I made in the three-day period. It, it can vary pretty wildly. Yeah, yeah. When you say you, you arrive at a picture of the game, is that is that a fairly complete picture in terms of like, oh, I need to use these mechanisms and I'm trying to, I may mean for uh, this style, et cetera, et cetera. Or is it something more narrow? Because I've heard designers say, many designers say in, in various interviews and such that they often work from a process of capturing a particular feeling on the part of the player. Uh, is, is that something that that you think about or is it or is it something broader that you're you're capturing i, I look for for how i want it to feel for the feeling i, w- I want the the tensions i want there to be the feeling what the players to have but it, it also is the mechanisms how are these things represented how do these things fit together i don't really want to have any real questions about how is this thing going to work when I get to the stage where I'm trying to put the thing together, like when I sit down to start writing the first draft of the rules, which happens very early on. And a lot of people tend to write rules later. They don't like writing rules. I like writing rules. When I'm writing the rules, I don't ever want to have to say, you know, put rule here when I figure it out. I need to know what all that is, how all that fits together before I actually get started. And also, but it also needs to be simple enough I can hold in, in, in my head. Uh, one one thing I, I like to say, uh, somewhat jokingly, but also seriously, is that I make my games a simple. I try to make my games simple enough that I can remember the rules. So I think if I was trying to do games that were more mechanically complicated and less streamlined, I'm not sure if my approach that I'm using now would really work for that because that's a lot to hold in your head. But I tend not to have a lot of exceptions. Uh, in my games, I tend to have things kind of fold together uh, mechanically, so I'm able to get that picture and then you know pursue it. Yeah. So then, is is most of the time usually spent on the play testing refinement stage? Like you get a draft of the game out quickly, and then a lot of the time spent in the in the in the final stages. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly almost all, all all the active time is spent in, in those final playtesting, balancing stages, trying to finesse stuff. And, and, and the playtesting can, can vary because I'm going to keep playtesting until it feels, until it resembles that picture, until mm-hmm. it feels the way I want it to feel. So again, you know, during that process, it, the, the, the picture might change, but having that picture to start with, it, it gives me a leg up and allows me to work on different things. And, and another thing is that I, I do work on several projects somewhat simultaneously in that when I reach a block on something, I'm gonna set it aside and work on something else. Yeah, I was gonna ask how many how many projects are you do you have that you're working on at the moment? Uh, so at the moment, uh, let's see. I'm working on a kind of sort of sequel to this guilty land called The Vote, about uh, basically about suffrage in America. That's a bit wider than that, but that's one. I am working on a solitaire civilization building game called NC. Uh, it's two. I'm working on a train game for next year because Mary says it's very important to get a train game next year. So that's, that's three. <laughs> I am working on a game about the Council of Nicaea. That'll probably be the year after, though, that that's coming out. But that's being worked on. That's four. I am working on a couple Hex Encounter games. Five and six. There's something else I'm working on. I'll, I'll say five or six right now that I'm working on uh, actively. Sure. You know, but there's other ideas that are, again, waiting to form that picture. Mm-hmm. And there's stuff, of course, that is coming out that, I mean, I'm I'm working on it, but it's basically done. Yeah. Like, uh, I have another solo game uh, about uh, Aurelian that's basically been done for a while. But, you know, I'll do some more testing right before, you know, we finalize, finalize it. Uh, Dinosaur Table Battles is coming out next spring. So we're doing some testing on that. But I pretty much have solved the design problems. It's more just confirming that it works and that nothing's out of whack. Are there any of your designs that have been particularly tricky? 
I mean, probably the trickiest would, would be this guilty land. That's just because it's such a difficult subject that I needed to engage with very carefully and very sensitively. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of wiggle room there. I had to make sure I, I, I get it right. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I, I think I did. That's, that's one reason why I'm, I'm very proud of that game. But there's so many ways that that could have gone wrong, uh, especially dealing with such a, 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 a fraught topic. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, I want to go into that a bit later uh, when I get into some specific games, at least the ones I've played. But first, my favorite question I thought of, because for uh, for regular listeners, I'm actually making an effort now to prepare my podcast questions and actually not just have like four words, four random words as my notes and then just go into it. So I actually have some questions written down. So I, I, I'm proud of myself for this one. Uh <laughs> Given that you're known for uh, very idiosyncratic designs, what do you think is your most normal game? <laughs> well, I'll see that. So, so a couple of things about that. I've done a number of hex encounter games, and they're probably closer as close as I'm going to get to a normal war game. Mm-hmm. Um, but even those, I mean, they have their 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 quirks. You know, I I could say, well, Irish Gage, that's a normal game. It's a broad crowd pleaser north and pacific which is uh republic by rio grande last year that's a normal game but there are people who tell you those are not normal games so i mean for me it, they feel normal mm-hmm. you know so so part of my games being idiosyncratic or weird part of it is i i'm doing what i think is normal but no one else seems to agree that's what i'm doing <laughs> uh but then to a degree, uh, I found, uh, much much like how I moved from Euro games to war games, when the war games turned out to be successful and the Euro games weren't, my weird games are much more successful than my normal games, to the point where I, I, I get a lot of encouragement, in, in a way, to do weird games, to explore that territory. And it's interesting territory, and I enjoy exploring it. But part of me kind of crawling out on, onto my weirdness limb these last couple of years is that those are the games that seem to resonate with people. Yeah. Yeah. And I seem to have an audience for, but yeah, I, I, I guess I would say Irish Gage is probably yeah, I suppose most those normal would be, game. Those are normal within the genre that they're in, right? Within that niche. Yeah. Uh, Cause you, you, know, the, 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 you talk the most who you game, ask. Or, <laughs> what's that? So it depends who you ask within that niche. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not super familiar. I, I've only played like one or two winsome style games, but but, you know, you talk to the average board gamer, they probably haven't mm-hmm. even heard of Winsome. And, you know, if you say train game, they're thinking ticket to ride. So true. I mean, I yeah. mean, one th- one thing is that I there was someone I met once who who did not realize that the, the Tom Russell who did the war games and along with Mary did Holland Spiel was also the same Tom Russell who did train games because it's, it's like they're different audiences. Now, yeah. again, there are a lot of there are a lot of Omni gamers. I think, and, and you're getting more and more of those. But there are people who just want, you know, they only know my economics games. And people who just know my war games, or just know my weird war games. And there are some people where, you know, there's no overlap there. With Hollenspiel in general, like, we have a core a group of customers that are basically just buying traditional or traditional-ish war games. And they, they will not buy something like Infamous Traffic. Or something like Forex, or something like this Guilty Land, and then you have people who will buy those things, but won't buy kind of the core war games. And they're, they're like they're different audiences with with different perspectives. And a big part, I think, of why we've been successful is that we're not trying to make games that appeal to everybody. Even within our catalog, not all our games are going to appeal to everybody. It's appealing to specific audiences, and making games that those audiences will respond to. And I and I hope, I mean, at least my experience, is I came in from Euro Games initially, Dominion was the first game that really got me hooked. And then only recently, like within the last year or so, have I like played an 18xx game, and now I'm really excited about 18xx games. And then, like I said, I played, you know, I, I played Twilight Struggle fairly early just because it was ranked so high, and then, but haven't played a ton of, war games until the last maybe two or three years um and i'm and i'm recognizing that oh there's this long established kind of history of 
18xx is kind of just its own thing and hex encounter war games are their own thing with their own communities historically and and i feel like although i don't have the broad perspective that there's more crossover happening now than ever before in terms of breaking out of those as kind of a singular niche of that's you know i only play hex encounter games or i only play euro games um at least i i hope it's happening because it certainly happened to me and you know i'm like I said, dipping my toes in all kinds of different styles, and I love it. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. It does seem to be the case. We are seeing more and more people who are, you know, um, omni gamers who, who who will try a little bit of everything, or will shift their their focus to different genres. There, there's an old chestnut in in the war game uh, world that uh, war games are dying. They have been dying since I don't know 1980. But there are always more people coming into it. Yeah. And I'm, we've seen that. We benefited from that uh, personally. So, you know, I, I, I think the, the nichiness of, of war games is somewhat overstated. Now, there are people who will never want to play a war game because they're too confrontational, because they don't want to engage with the history. And, you know, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, I think they are becoming more appealing. And you are having more people who just want more more types of games more stuff mm-hmm. yeah uh and want want those things to be more approachable and i think that's a big part of why board games as an industry have continued to grow and become bigger yeah which which kind of leads into irish gauge because i think capstone has done this a couple of times and kind of taking games that are might have been within a niche or a niche sorry I, 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 oh, I, I do mix it all the, time. the two pronunciations of the word into a hybrid that is not a correct pronunciation and kind of giving it a bigger audience potentially. Do you think there's there's potential for that for, for Irish Gage to kind of show people that, hey, there's these train games, these cube rail games that are out here and, and they're really cool and interesting? I I, I, I think so, yes. And, you know, I, I don't have numbers for sure, but I am – pretty certain that Irish Gage has probably sold more copies than anything else I've done. And Clay Ross at Campstone, uh, he is a very smart guy. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to make uh, an attractive package that's very approachable and get people into these kind of games. And I, I, I think I think it is getting a lot of traction. It does. I mean, I, I don't remember a game that I've done getting this kind of traction. And I remember a, kind of a wave of cube rail games that came out when I was starting in the hobby, but it does seem like this is getting more attention. Uh, I hope so because they're fun games. I, I, yeah. I enjoy. I mean, I, I did five of them. I, I enjoy the uh, uh, cube rail type uh, games. Yeah, and they yeah. also kind of break from the stereotype that you know train games are super complex and heavy because it's not. Like it's, I was no. I was surprised at how simple the game was. Yeah, a, a, a lot of people have said that, and you know, it, it's not the simplest train game that I've done. That was probably North and Pacific because it has two rules, but uh, it was meant to be kind of simple and, and approachable in a way. I, I would like, you know, a game of mine to do really well in, in a traditional run and have it then fix eyes over on Holland Spiel. That hasn't really been the case so far, but yeah, you know, I got my fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope so. I really hope so. Moving on to a, a, a different cube rail game that you released recently, the Sioux Line, uh, which is certainly more quirky than Irish Gage. Uh, I remember I heard I heard r- murmurs about it before I got to play it, and it's like, well, it's a train game, but I never ran a company <laughs> because uh, there are only three companies in the game. There are only three companies. There's kind of this high concept mm-hmm. idea is that you know it's a train game with probably more players than there are companies was was that something that you had from the beginning was that like the picture you wanted for that game when you designed it that was always a central part of it yeah that that was kind of where it originated from and a big reason why i didn't pitch it to winsome why it was a homeless Peel game is because it it kind of was taking one of these sort of rules of thumb about train game design where you want to have at least as many companies as there are players and say, well, what if we don't do that? What, what is the result? And, um, personally, uh, me personally, I, 
I enjoy playing train games where I'm working on closer to a pure investment strategy where it's not about the operations of a company that I'm doing. It's I'm investing in other companies and uh, seeing how well I do picking the companies that I want to invest in, right? Other people find that a lot less interesting. And there are people who do not care for Sue Line because they never get to run a company. And there are people who don't care for it because, you know, they'll say, well, the auction at the beginning of the game is 80% of the game. And I'm not saying it isn't. I, th- I think, it, I mean, yeah, 80% of it probably is that five-minute auction. And then you get the 40-minute game after it. And again, that was me kind of leaning into something, which is you have a tendency in some games, uh, some 18xx games particularly, where you know people say, well, the game was decided in the initial auction. So I thought, well, let's have a game where that initial auction is very important. It might not decide the entire game. It depends how players do in the auction. But let's let's have an auction that has outsized importance. And let's let's put marry it to this concept of maybe not running a railroad. Uh, one thing is that by having the private companies, the mines in the game, players hopefully are still invested in what's happening on the map. Because they're not the ones placing the cubes or making those decisions. Those decisions affect them and, and their standing. And that has also inform their investment decisions. Because, you know, if I'm going to buy a share of stock and I can only buy one share of stock each stock round, where am I putting that money? Uh, how much of it is going to be what looks like a good investment? How much of it is I don't want to give money to the yellow company because the yellow company is going to close my mind if it gets money to build with? So that's kind of the whole thing with Sue Line. And so that's a weird way to approach it. That's a weird way to make a train game and uh, kind of experimental, I guess. And that was kind of the thrust of it and, and why, again, we said, you know, this is going to be a Holland Spiel game. I'm yeah, not going yeah. to pitch this to John Bohr because. He's not going to be able to to license this to a big publisher because a big publisher would be crazy to publish this. Something that's this aggressively weird. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's also you know I, I only got to I've only been able to play it once so far, and it also surprised me how dramatic the kind of arcs of the three companies are because the Sioux line itself is so stymied at the beginning of the game and takes a long time. But in the game I played, at least it ended up miles ahead in terms of its value uh, compared to the other two companies, it, which I, which I found really fascinating and something that I, I wasn't able to see just from the, you know, the rules and what was presented to me that, that something so dramatic would happen. Yeah, no, that, and that, you know, people have different opinions about the viability of the three railroads. I think, all three railroads in the game are terrible, um, yeah, but they're terrible in di- accurate, they're terrible, they're terrible in different ways. And uh, people tend to focus on the Sioux as being like the most terrible, but it has a lot of shares. And so people are more likely to invest in Sioux than in the other two railroads because there are nine shares instead of five. And so in the late game, it, it can be very strong, but then if you know you, you flub it, uh, because if you don't place a cube, you're forced to withdraw, uh, not, not withdraw, withhold. And if you withhold, uh, your share value drops by by one space on the track for every share in player hand. So that could be an eight or a nine share uh, box drop, which is extremely uh, dramatic. But yeah, uh, and that was from the point of, of uh, that was kind of the thrust of making them kind of very asymmetric companies. I'm not sure if I'm going to do a train game that's that weird again. Because one thing is that while it sold very well and a lot of people were very receptive to it, you know, a lot of train gamers are looking for things that are a little less crazy. And I, I've done games that are less crazy. And I'm probably, you know, future train games that, that I do for Alex will probably be not not exactly, not exactly normal, but uh, closer to normal than, than Sue Line was. Yeah, I think I think I my introduction to... 18x X game specifically was with 49. I don't know if you've played that one in Sicily. I haven't played that one, no. But now that I've played a few of them, I'm realizing that that is a very bizarre one. Like, <laughs> half the board costs like $120 to lay track because it's just like all mountains and a vol- the volcano erupts halfway through the game and destroys one of the major cities and 
Uh, like all but one of the companies are horrible uh, unless they work together with another company to lay track because you can't afford both trains and track. And it was like, it was wild. I'm like, wow, that's an 18 XX game. Okay. And then uh, I've since oh. found the more normal ones, <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah I, I've heard of people who their, their, their first cube rail game was Sioux line. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if that should be your first one. <laughs> yeah. This is not a representative example. Oh, yeah. moving on to four X, which again was the game with the, introduced me to Holland Spiel as a company. What was the inspiration there? Did it start with the idea of currency trading or was it, was it something else? Uh, I started with the idea of currency trading. I was interested okay. in, in the topic and that was, I mean, that is the game that I have had published that had the, the earliest like design date. That was a very early game I designed and I could not find a home for it because oh, I mean, it, it is what it is. You know, I, 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 I tried some publishers and like they're like, I don't see how we could sell this. Who who would buy this? And <laughs> I even talked to a couple of publishers who basically did the 18xx games, you know, the ones where you, you, you order the game and will hand cut the tiles and that. And they're like, no one's going to buy this. So I, I kind of just, you know, shelled it. Like I, I did this thing. I was kind of kind of compelled to do it, really. Like I, I felt really strongly about doing this game and I, I didn't really understand why. And I, you know, I enjoyed it. My group enjoyed it. We tested it. We played it uh, for years. But said, well, we're probably never going to publish this. And then Mary uh, said, "Okay, we have a company. We're going to publish Forex." I'm like, "I don't, I don't know about this." She says, "No, we're publishing this. It's going to do really well." And uh, and she was right. It it sold a lot of copies uh, initially, at least. And that that is why it's out in the world. Yeah, and and you even put there's, there's this whole couple paragraphs of text on the back of the box. Uh, I think it be, how does it begin? Why did you buy this game? Why did you buy this game? Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's basically a giant warning about what this game is. Um, how much of that was, you know, the joke and how much was actual fear over people buying the game and then being upset? Oh, it, it was a hundred percent actual fear. It was a hundred percent fear. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh yeah. No, no, I, I was, we were a hundred percent. We, and we did it with style, but we were 100% sincere. And this game is for a very small audience. Most people are not going to like this game. Uh, here are reasons why you're not going to like this game. Think very carefully before buying this game. And the problem is a lot of people bought it who, who shouldn't have bought it and were upset that it, it was not what they wanted it to be. Even um, with the warning. Even with the warning, I think because of the warning, because they either thought we were joking. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, th th there was, I remember a comment on, on the Board Game Geek where the guy was like, designer himself says, if you don't like this game, don't play me. Turns out he wasn't kidding. No, <laughs> no, I wasn't. Or people who we said, this is not for everybody. This is for a small audience. And they read into it. Well, I'm that, that audience. And some were and, and some weren't. And it kind of that whole period of time leading up to the release it was kind of like watching a car wreck in slow motion because we, we were trying to tell people you you probably don't want this this is super niche you probably don't want this and like the more we said it the more they wanted it and um it's the curiosity factor right yeah to, to a degree and but you know so, so here's the thing a game has kind of a natural life cycle where when it comes out, it's going to sell X number of copies in the first quarter. In the second quarter, typically, it's going to sell half as many as X. In the third quarter, half as many as that. Uh, now, it might pick up again. Some games are kind of evergreens that always have strong sales. Some games get kind of a shot in the arm because they get a lot of attention focused on them and selling the cycle starts over again. But it's generally, you know, we have initial sales and we have this, this sloping line of additional sales. And that's kind of what our whole model is built on, really, uh, because the idea is, especially for the games that I've designed, uh, not the games we've licensed from outside designers for a short period of time, but the ones I've designed, is that for the rest of my life, these games are going to be in print and providing some kind of income for us. So long term, that that lifespan of the game is very important. 
Forex comes out, it sells really well initially. Uh, sold a lot of copies, and then the people, there are people who really liked the game, and the people who really didn't, it was very divisive. And because it was divisive, because there was this this backlash and this negative reaction, it did not have that natural life cycle. It, it just went off the cliff. I mean, it flatlined huh. um, to the point where I think if we sold half as many copies initially, at this point, we would have sold more copies overall. Yeah, if people were more careful. People would be more careful. Cause, cause there, there, there are a lot of people, I think, who would enjoy the game, and, but were turned off by the the negativity. And I'm not saying this, there's anything wrong with someone not liking the game. I mean, that that's fine. Uh, you know, I, that doesn't upset me. I think what upsets me is that a lot of people, uh, well, not a lot of people, but there were a vocal minority of people who felt that we were pulling a fast one, that we had lied about what the game was, that we were doing some kind of shell game, bait and switch, to convince them to buy this game that, that they wouldn't like, while all the time we were saying, don't buy this game. Mm-hmm. And that was deeply upsetting, because we, we, we tried to conduct ourselves as as honest people. Yeah, yeah. And try to be straightforward, and we are trying like heck to be as straightforward as possible and, and, and to be the level with people about what this game was. And then to have people get this information and then say we were lying about, about it. It's, it's upsetting. Like it's to the point where I don't play that game anymore. I can't look at the game a lot of time anymore, which is not an experience I've had with anything else, you know? So yeah, it's, yeah. uh, it, 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 it's frustrating. I mean, it still does sell some copies, and I hear from people time to time who, who do enjoy it. Sometimes it's someone who enjoys it, and they can't find anyone else to play with because no one else enjoys it. You know, and, and that, that, that's fine. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not complaining. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it was quite an experience trying trying very hard to communicate what it was. Yeah, and and then not have that get across was yeah, it was something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've only been able to play it once. I, we, my friends and I, we've been wanting to play it again, but we never just found the time or, or enough other people to get in a game. And my impression, I, I found it fascinating. I don't know. It's the kind of game where you play and you're like, did I enjoy that? I don't know. But it was certainly something. And it seemed to me that I went in expecting it to be... Because when I hear, you know, it's an economic game, I'm thinking of an economic Euro game where you're trying to work through a puzzle, but it was so much more interactive than I anticipated. Here's my hypothesis about the game, is that ultimately it's this kind of political game because how it works, you know, every every bit of how the different currencies change value in relationship to each other is player driven. And... I haven't tested it out, but it seems like, you know, a group of people could get together and say, okay, we're going to raise the the pound or whatever. I don't remember which currencies are actually in there. And they could just collaborate or, or collude, I guess, depending on how you look at it, and make the pound super dominant. And the implication of that being that it could be a game about managing these alliances and backstabbings and, and like cartel behavior is is that accurate is that how the game can play out that's that's one way it can play out it, it's really kind of i don't want to say sandbox because that's kind of a it's, it's a buzzword these days but i mean it's really the game is the players yeah there, there's well, a it's system just this, it's there's just an architecture grid of interconnected levers mm-hmm Right, yeah, and it, and however you and your your friends or, or enemies pull those levers, push those buttons is is what results in the game. And there is nothing preventing the players from driving one thing up or driving one thing down, other than what the players themselves are doing. Uh, sometimes not really understanding what they're doing, but. That, that that is essentially the game, and there there's a I, I talk about sometimes that there's a custodial aspect to it because the economy of the game, how robust it is, how much room you have to maneuver, 
it really depends on the actions you're all taking. And if players aren't careful, it can be a, a very brittle economy. You, you, you can basically break the, this, this complex interaction of currencies. And, you know, essentially, the currencies only have the values that you give them. They have no actual fixed value at all. And that's kind, kind of the whole crux of the game is that th- these monies, these pieces of paper, these actions you're taking only have the value that the players decide they have in aggregate. And that's, that's kind of the, uh, the big experimental thing at the heart of it, yeah, which, it, does, which does resonate pure, with some people. Right. From an, from yeah. an economic sense, it's, it's just, this is, it's just subjective valuations, you know, in, in economic pricing in a smaller system. Yeah. And it, it does resonate with some people and with, uh, other people, it, it doesn't, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait to play it again. I, I, I really think it's, it's thank you. such it's, a fascinating design. Whether well, again, Beside whether uh, how much enjoyment I get in the moment, you know, looking back, it's it's a really interesting design. Finally, let's go to this guilty land because I, I know you said I, I've read you say that it's the game you're most proud of, and I think you've said that you don't think you'll ever top this guilty land as a design. But why is that? Well, it's almost certainly the most ambitious thing I've done, and I feel like I accomplished the things that I set out to do with it. I'm not an unambitious uh, person or designer, but I tend to aim a lot smaller. And this was going for something bigger, tackling something that is a lot more complicated and uh, heavy and serious. And I feel like I pulled all that off. So there's that sense of accomplishment and that sense of, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that again. I'm not like, champion at the bit to cover another really heavy subject again anytime soon. I mean, first of all, it required me spending a year and a half kind of mired in that period and the rhetoric of that period, which isn't terribly dissimilar from the rhetoric of of the current period. And that's a really depressing place to inhabit for that length of time. And I knew that going in. I knew going in, this is going to be very draining and exhausting. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's going to be worth it at the end. Uh, and it was draining and exhausting, but it did turn out to be worth it at the end. Uh, also, on a, on a mechanical level, uh, it's a game I find very compelling and very interesting. And I played it more than any of my other games. I played it hundreds of times it, to the point where I had to kind of hide the box from myself because if it was out in the open, uh, available, I would just be playing it instead of working on other things. I, I find it incredibly compelling as a play experience. Uh, and I also think it kind of is the closest thing I have to, to a, a, an example of what I think games can do and what games can be. Uh, the, the power of modeling systems in games. So, you know, all that combined, that's a lot. That's, that's, and I don't know if I'm going to do, I'm not, I'm not consciously trying to, to, to top it. I mean, maybe I will. Yeah. I figure I have uh, almost 50 games out. I'm, I'm getting pretty close. I'll probably do about 200 more before I retire. Maybe one of those will also, you know, hit that level or, 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 or go beyond it. But uh, I'm not consciously pursuing that because I'm, you know, I'm I'm looking at trying to do an entire body of work because there are some designers who might do in their lifetime eight or nine games, and each of those games have to be some kind of I don't know some kind of major statement. I don't have that compulsion, you know. I've I've done my my big serious game. I don't know if I'm gonna do another big serious one. Maybe I will. I mean, I take I take them all seriously, but I don't know if I'm ever gonna go that big again. Yeah, put myself through the ringer for that again, or have something that is—I I don't want to say important. It sounds really pretentious, but um, I feel like the game means something more than some of my other games mean something, and I feel good about that. Yeah, you know. And and for those listening who uh, who aren't familiar with this guilty land, it, it's about the legislative battle over the abolition of slavery in America. I know 
in the rule book, I think it's the very first thing in the rule book, you specifically say that the game is pushing a particular thesis, which is different than mm-hmm. you see with many historical games where the implication, at least, if not the outright statement, is that they're just trying to be an impartial modeler of whatever happened as much as possible. But you say, no, I'm going to push a very specific thesis. Uh, what is that thesis and in, in how mechanically did you try to drive that idea? The, the thesis is that slavery in America could not have been abolished strictly through legislation or the building of support, but would require the Civil War. That the Civil War was of some sort, a Civil War, was necessary to decide this because there could not really be a compromise. Morally, ethically, there could not be a compromise on this issue. Slavery had to be abolished. And, and no one fighting for abolition would accept anything less. And the people who were benefiting from slavery, they would not accept the abolition of slavery and would fight it tooth and nail. And calls for compromise between the two, people decrying the, the radicals on both sides, they only really helped the side of the equation that is oppressing people. And so the way the game models this is it, it tries to show in the system how opinion radicalizes, how stalemate happens, and how the systems that we try to use to solve problems fail to solve this problem. Part of that is the marker play. So uh, you have basically three factions. There's justice, there is oppression, and there is compromise, which is in between the two factions, a non-player faction. And through the card play, you are trying to basically get markers from one side to the other. But once a marker is yours, once it is a justice marker instead of a, a compromise marker, generally it's going to stay a justice marker because you're not going to convince someone who's an abolitionist that, oh, maybe slavery is okay after all. That's not going to happen. Similarly, people who are hardcore dedicated to the continuation of slavery, where they're committed oppression markers, they're not going to suddenly decide, oh, maybe we should uh, not be terrible people. <laughs> and so these sites radicalize and, and stagnate. And the compromise faction only really helps oppression, because as far as the way the laws are passed, Generally, the compromise faction can be persuaded to join oppression because they just want people not to fight. Uh, it's looking at how this doesn't function. The, the legislative aspect, it deadlocks. The public opinion, it deadlocks. And none of these things actually achieve the goal of abolition. So the game is going to end with a kind of stalemate. Now, maybe one side is winning the game or losing the game, and really the victory doesn't almost doesn't matter because the end result is the game ends, then the Civil War is going to happen, and that is how slavery is going to be abolished. So in a way, it is intentionally built so that victory is is unsatisfying, as it were, because you cannot, I mean, you can win the game, but you cannot win the actual struggle in the arena that you're trying to win it in, that you're fighting it in. And that kind of is the, the big thesis of the game um, and, and the lens through which it's viewing the history. And I, I, I feel strongly that, you know, you do hear people who, who feel that a war game needs to be objective. And they don't really mean objective. They mean it needs to give equal balance to both sides of, of, of an issue, that it needs to give both sides a kind of parity. Uh, as far as being valid. But that is not always the case. Mm-hmm. There is no valid argument for for the enslavement and torture and murder of human beings, for the dehumanization of human beings. So I'm, I'm, I was okay taking that stand, you know, of, of saying, hey, slavery, spoiler warning, was bad. And I was kind of surprised by the number of people who were upset that I said slavery was bad. I did not think that was a opinion I would run into, but uh, but I did. 
Really? People uh, explicitly from from just a a theoretical thing that games should be more balanced and level headed, or are they actually like gung ho, let's bring slavery back people? There were very few in that in that later group, but there there were people who were like, Well, you know, it didn't need to be a civil war. They could have just I don't know, it work itself out eventually or you know, minimize where slavery was. Well, that doesn't end slavery. Mm-hmm. You know, and that says that you're okay with it. And it's not something people should ever be okay with. I th- I think the thing about history in general is that anytime that we're we're telling a story, we're we're telling a, a, a historical story, it's as much a reflection of the person telling it and and the, the time in which they're telling it as it is the time in which it happened and the people of that time and the way they reflected their own story. So I don't know if you really need to be quote unquote objective in in the sense of you need to not take a side because there are things that are worth taking sides about. Yeah. And you run into this less with a a battle game. And for a lot of people, a war game is, a, is, is going to be a battle game. And there are people who will look at something like this guilty land and say, that's not a war game. There is there is conflict, but and it's historical simulation, but it's not really a war game because there's no one shooting at each other. I mean, even though, you know, there is violence within the game. But regardless, in a battle game, you're not going to have generally a, a moral position to take a stand on in a battle game. And then you're looking more at the the reality of who has better commanders, who has better weapons, who has more men, who has the good terrain. But even there, I think if if a war game is really worth designing and worth playing, it needs to have some kind of thesis. Like, what are you telling me about this event? What, what do you think are the decisive factors? And how are you giving that weight within the design? Mm-hmm. So I, I think objectivity is kind of a... I think really good design knows that as objective as you're being, you have to have a point of view and express it. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. Well, and in some sense, if even if you're trying to be completely objective about it, like a point of view is going to slip in there, especially with a historical game. Because, I mean, like... I suppose with with games that are simulating a particular battle, that's probably as objective as you can be in a design, because you're just trying to find out the geographical reality, the positional reality, like, you know, things that objectively happened and then try to simulate it from there. But, I mean, even then, there, there's there's judgment calls and there's ideas and presuppositions that have to slip in there. Oh, Inevitably. exactly. I, I did a game on the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Uh, which is probably the closest I did to a Hex Encounter game that is a traditional Hex Encounter game with a odds-based CRT. And the thing with the Franco-Prussian War is that the Germans, uh, the Prussians, but the Germans, uh, wiped the floor with the French. But the French were a better army on paper. They had better weapons and better training, but they had fewer men, and they didn't have quite the same same doctrine. So I did this game trying to represent these factors, and one of the publishers I pitched it to before it finally found its, its eventual home, uh, they looked at this, and they looked at the fact that the, the French units had higher combat factors generally. And they had higher combat factors because they had better training and better infantry weapons than the Germans did. But they said, well, the Germans should have the higher attack ratings because they're the ones that uh, that won and they're the ones that should have been stronger on the attack. And I, I said, you know, I, I get where you're coming from, but the way those factors are rounded in this game and the way the movement rules work and the way the supply rules work, those give those Germans the advantages they need so we can represent the French uh, being on paper, on, on the counter, better, even though they don't end up being better in, in the play of the game. So that was the, the thesis I had. The, the perspective I had is, let's look at why this army that was better on paper was not better in reality, and let's represent that by representing the, the, the paper aspects, the 
higher combat factor and whatnot. Um, so players can feel and see how important the doctrine was, how important the Prussian general staff was, how important the supply situation was. So it's still, even though it's an objective reality, I'm making a judgment call to pursue a particular thesis. And I think that creates a more meaningful design than, uh, like, well, I guess the Germans should have higher combat factors because they're the ones that won. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you yeah know? for sure. Returning to this guilty land, in terms of how the game might model or how the, how the game's results would look if that happened in real life. Like when you say that the end, like after the game, the civil war happens, would you say then that if a play of the game was to model what happened in reality, that justice won the game and then the civil war happened? Or is it, am I looking at that correctly? So, so the, so whoever wins the game, whatever the situation is in the game it, at the end, it's almost meaningless because the Civil War happens. And the Civil War happens, and the Union wins, and slavery is abolished as a result of that. Mm-hmm. So justice can win the game. Uh, oppression can win the game. It can go either way. It can be very lopsided. It can be very close. But ultimately, none of that matters historically because, because the, Civil the, War the Civil War happens, happens and the, anyways. In, in and, and the actual arena where we are having this legislative and, and public discourse debate ultimately does not matter. It's ultimately futile. It's still important. It's still important to stand for things and to push for things. But in this particular situation, because those sides were so entrenched mm-hmm. and a necessity, because there is no circumstance under which an abolitionist could have or should have compromised with slavery. It needed to end. Uh, morally and ethically, that's the only way it could be resolved. that will be moral and, and ethical. And so, however the game turns out, and, and however you experience the game, there still should be that, that kind of sense of, whatever we've done, the Civil War is still going to happen, because either, whatever side's ahead, the other side's not going to let yeah. that side continue to be ahead. There's still it's a not succession gonna, attempt. Yep. I think this is the kind of thing where games should go. Like I, this is what th- these kinds of games, the, the games that have actual like provocative, interesting, deep thought behind them in terms of advancing an argument or advancing an idea. I'm not saying all games need to do that. Like, you know, the, the stereotypical, just fun, th- non thematic Euro is, is fun too. But I mean, mm-hmm. this is what's really getting me excited in the world of games. And I love, I, I love that you're doing designs like this. That you're that you're looking at it from the perspective of actually advancing uh, a position on whatever your 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 setting is. So yeah, thank you, thank you for designing well, well, well. odd and unusual and, and provocative games. Well, well, thank you for saying that. That that's very kind. And uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's kind of the stuff that excites me most about games right now too. And I still do games that are. A lot less ambitious, and uh, oh, of course, yeah. But it's I think that's the direction where the more interesting work is going to be done with games. Games are particularly useful for modeling systems because games are systems, right? Yeah. So, as far as conveying an understanding of systemically systemic issues, how how they happen, of of the structural foundations of say oppression in 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 a in a uh, civil rights kind of environment games can do that in ways that other things can't because games literalize what you're doing it it makes it concrete and so by taking something that's kind of abstract like a system and making it concrete and allowing players to push and pull within that system to see how the things interact with each other can be very valuable i think towards conveying how these systems that that affect all of us work. I think that's a much more valuable direction for games to pursue than, um, you know, right now, kind of the big thing I think that I hear about a lot is trying to make games that are more narrative and trying to have games that, that evoke more complicated emotions 
and identification with characters. And that's fine. And when people pull it off, it's kind of like a magic trick because it's working almost opposite of what is essential to games that other things don't have. But I think if more people are leaning into how do we model a system in a game, how do we convey information systemically in a way that we can't through a story, I, I, I think the sky's the limit there. Yeah. I, I, I've i done as much as I'm probably going to do for a while there, but at least something that that, that, that big and, and daunting of a topic. But I, I could see people taking that approach and creating some very interesting, very useful, very valuable, very important, very influential games. Yeah. So it's a very exciting time. You know, games have been around for thousands of years, right? Sure, but yeah. It, it feels like right now is, is is that kind of we're starting to actually learn what games can do. And that's very exciting. And there's the evolution because the, the very earliest games you have, like the two main abstracts that survived Go and Chess, but almost any other like very like ancient game is basically just rolling dice. It's some kind of random misgenerator that, that you can wager on. And then, you know, once you hit the 20th century, you get uh, war games, the idea of simulating something with the game, and then uh, kind of very casual, just family, you know, doing things as a family or these like moral instructive games that are just, you know, candy land with stuff on them. But now we're, you know, there's all of a sudden this explosion where there are so many different branching ideas of what games can do. And, and when you mention narrative kind of being the, the trend now, I hadn't thought of this before, but I mean, I haven't thought of it in this way, but that seem, that makes sense to me. And the approach of something like this Guilty Land, you know, following what like we talked about with you think very systemically, when you think of the game as a medium, there are two aspects to it. There's the physical reality of the components and the rules, and then there's the interaction of the players with that and with themselves. And I know in in, in criticism of other things, of, of books and movies, there's there's different schools of thought of how you treat that interaction. But the interaction can't be avoided in the game, really. Like, you could mm-hmm. maybe do con- some kind of deconstructionist thing of, of game criticism, but I, I think you lose so much about what the medium is and it's it, the interaction is so fundamental. And, you know, I love the games that are pushing things on the interactive level, but there's, there's so much you can do with being intentional about the system, the actual physical rules part of the game that I think that there's a lot of ways that can go. There are a lot of, there's a lot of uncharted territory, perhaps. I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of, if people haven't heard of Holland Spiel before this podcast or haven't heard of, of Tom Russell and they're interested in kind of getting the Tom Russell experience via games, what what are some titles you, you would suggest them looking into? Oh, my gosh. I would suggest probably Irish Gage because that's going to be probably the one people are going to enjoy the most, be most more, more people, be more broadly appealing. As far as specific Holland Spiel titles, though, I mean, this Guilty Land, is, it is the best thing I've done. And it, it is the most interesting thing I've done. I have a game called Table Battles, which is very popular. We've done a number of expansions for it, which is a, a very quick, abstract, dice-based uh, game to simulate certain battles. Uh, I have a new game coming out called Westphalia, which is for six players and only six players. Exactly six players. You cannot play it with five. I love that. It has to be six. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a negotiation war game because the, the essential history of it is that during the final years of the Thirty Years' War, as they are negotiating a peace, they are still fighting each other because that will give them an edge at the negotiation table. And so it alternates those two things, and it's uh, very interactive and very asymmetric. Yet I, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, so it's a six-player game, but you'll play it in two hours. So it's it's not some big six-player games that take a lot of of time. I don't know. I just, I just I've done a lot of games. Yeah. And 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 certainly some stand out more than others. But you know I like all of them, and they all do different things for different audiences. You know, I'm, I, honestly, 
a big part of my part of Alan Spiel, uh, cause Mary handles pretty much everything. Uh, but a big part of what I do is I, I convince people not to buy our games. I explain, okay, you're not going to like this one. You might like this one, but you're probably not going to like that one. And, and giving that kind of personal touch. And I will do that in Board Game Geek. I, I, I will talk to people and say, okay, what, what else do you like? What are you interested in? You might not like this thing, but you might like that one. Uh, we do that on, on the Twitter as well. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how I first got your game because i had, I had heard, I had heard of Four X, and I was like, "Well, I, I'll try to pick this up." And then, oh no, no, I it was separate. I had heard of Four X, and I kind of filed it in the back of my mind. And then I think I tweeted something about how I never played a Hex Encounter game, you know, and I want to play one. What would people recommend? And you responded and you said, hey, we got a sale going on right now. Here's a list of six Hex Encounter games we sell. And I asked you a couple of questions and I ended up getting uh, Blood in the Fog and, and 4X because then I, I went to the site and like, oh yeah, I remember <laughs> hearing about that game. And yeah, so people listening, uh, Tom's uh, very responsive on Twitter, which is which is great. Well, I, you know, I, I'm home all day, so I don't have much to do. <laughs> He's just uh, sitting there waiting to answer your questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess I would say uh, top list, uh, this guilty land table battles. Maybe Sue Line? I, I mean, it, it's a weird game, but all my games are weird games. I can't say, you know, I, I can't pretend they're not weird games. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to decide what what will ease people into it, or should they be eased? You know, should they just like here? Let me hit you over the head with this. So, um, but we got. I mean, go to hospital dot com. There you go. Go to hospital dot com. We have our whole catalog there. Look and see what, what sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah. Pick pick what sounds interesting. Well, I hope for those listening, this has been instructive. If you are interested in Hallsby, at least the, you know talking about the ones that I've played and talking about your the way you design. Thank you again so much for for coming on the podcast. This has been a, a fascinating discussion on my end. Hopefully on yours as well. I've been wanting to interview you for a while since I, I played a few of your games. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that will wrap it up. Oh, I was going to ask. Uh, what else do you have coming out soon? You mentioned Westphalia and I think one other game. Do you have anything else coming out soon on the on the docket? Okay, so uh, we're coming to the end of the year. We just released Escape from Hades, which is a solitaire science fiction game designed by Fred Manzo and developed by Herman Lutman, uh, which is our first science fiction game. And oh, fun. it's a game that's kind of financially was a risk because – the art budget for a science fiction game is a lot more than our other games. So we need to sell a lot more copies to break even. But we're fine taking that risk, though, because, first of all, we believe in the game. And second of all, we can kind of do what we want. You know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, who cares? Coming out, we have another game in our Horse and Musket series uh, from Sean Chick and Johan Bratstrom. And then Westphalia at the end of the year. Toledo War is our freebie game. Uh, next year, we got a bunch of stuff on the horizon, a couple solo games. The big games next year are going to be uh, At All Costs, which is a sequel to To the Last Man. People are familiar with that. There's a game called Streets of Shadows, designed by Joseph Miranda and Roger Mason, which is about occupied France, occupied Paris in World War II. Um, and you, in that game, you are neither... Uh, resistant fighters or collaborators you're someone in the middle kind of working with both trying to play the angle so that you come out on top whoever wins the war oh interesting so it, yeah it, it, it's a very uh interesting game and uh we're really excited to be getting that one out and then uh towards the end of the year we'll have the vote which will is is similar to this guilty land but much less depressing of a topic it's a completely different situation because with this guilty land you know, as we we're talking about, the systems we used to solve problems didn't work. Hence, it had to come to war. With the vote, the systems did work. I mean, sometimes they were working in the wrong direction, but essentially, eventually, things were achieved through the ways we usually like to think that we solve problems. So it's similar in some ways, but it's a completely different uh, sort of model. So that that's exciting for me. Uh, that What's one. The and that's be that? our, what, what vote is it referencing? Uh, uh, so it is largely referencing uh, women's suffrage in the United States. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's also dealing with voter suppression, 
uh, Jim Crow laws, some of the more uh, xenophobic aspects of of that struggle for you know the exclusion of of Asian Americans from voting, mm-hmm. the exclusion of Indians from American Indians from citizenship, and it's kind of that whole mess, and how you know eventually these things do to some degree get resolved through the so-called normal channels, with still acknowledgement of ways in which things still fall short and continue to fall short. So that's kind of the you know, two minute view of, of that game. Uh, but with a lot of mechanical similarity to this guilty land, just a very different emphasis. Mm-hmm. I'm doing a drain game for next year. I'm still working on it. I don't have a title yet. Dinosaur table battles. Mary would be very upset with me. I didn't mention dinosaur table battles, which is, I think the most important game ever published. <laughs> I, I think, I think is what we're going with. It's only the most important one in 2020. Don't buy any other game. Buy dinosaur table battles. That's going to be the game to buy. It's table battles, but with dinosaurs. What else could you want? I don't know. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, go to Holland Spiel. There's a, all kinds of games for all kinds of interests. Uh, if they want to find you on Twitter, what's your Twitter handle? Okay. So, you there's a Twitter handle at Holland Spiel. That's the official company account. Mary generally is the one answering stuff there, but I'll, I'll see stuff there as well. Uh, our personal account is at Tom and Mary. And generally, I'm the one tweeting at that account. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then I would also like to say, if you go to Hollenspiel, you'll see that they have a a podcast, the Tom and Mary Show, I think it's called. uh, Mary and Tom Show. Mary and Tom Show, uh, which is very entertaining. I listened to to a few episodes. I love it. Uh, Thank you. It's a good one. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out also the thoughtfulgamer.com. I just changed, uh, had the look of the website, new logo, new design. Hopefully, uh, I, I think it looks a lot better, so I hope you agree. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me on social media, Twitter, and Facebook. Just look up the Thoughtful Gamer, you'll find it. And I always forget. Oh, yes, Patreon. I I always screw up the outro. We screwed up both intro and outro. So this is a very very on brand podcast. If you want to support the thoughtful gamer, go to patreoncom slash gamer. You get all kinds of rewards. We'll be doing another giveaway pretty soon, actually, of a, of a board game. Maybe I'll throw a Holland Spiel title as one of the games you might be able to win. Again, that's patreoncom slash gamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.